All right, if you'll take your Bibles, please open them to Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. And uh, we're going to start at verse 20. And inasmuch as he was not made a priest without an oath, for they had become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. And also there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who was holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily, as those high priests, to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who have weaknesses, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the Son who has been perfected forever. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you give to us grace in this day. And I pray, Lord, that you would show us your mercy and your truth in everything that we do. I pray, God, that you would give us the ability to think deeply on the glory of Christ in his role as mediator and intercessor, that you would lift our eyes to behold him as he is, to worship him as he deserves to be worshipped, and to love him, God, with all of our hearts and passion. Father, remind us, that he is the reason that this life matters. That everything we do and everything we are comes from him and returns to him. And we pray, God, that the glory of Jesus might dwell upon us in all that we say and do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So in everything that God does, the glory of Christ and the display of that glory is always his foremost consideration. So it should come as no surprise to us that in the eternal intercession of Jesus, this is true as well. We often look at the things that we receive from God through a lens that makes all motive and praise about what we get. But it's worth the time and effort for us to consider the glory and beauty of what Jesus does in his intercession, simply for the sake of seeing Jesus exalted and lifted high. So at the start, I want to think with you about Jesus and who he is and what he's actually doing in his intercession. We've been on this verse for a few weeks now. I think this is week four. Um, and we've been talking about his eternal priesthood, his eternal intercession is where we were last week. And as I was preparing last week's message, it occurred to me that that, that eternal nature of his priesthood and his intercession for us is a source of great glory that I don't think we consider. I don't think we think about how gracious and kind and loving and beautiful Christ is in his intercession for us and how his unchanging nature is a huge part of that. So the, the catechism, if you guys can remember all those catechisms that we read, the catechism says the only redeemer of God's elect is the Lord Jesus Christ, who being the eternal son of God became man and so was and continues to be God and man in two distinct natures and one person forever. Now, why do I bring this up? I bring this up because Christ's nature as fully human, as if he were not God, and fully God, as if he were not human, remains exactly that forever. When Christ became manifestly human, when he became incarnate, when he put on humanity, it wasn't a change of clothes that he put on for a season and then took off. He fundamentally was transformed in his nature but his person remained unchanged, okay? Who he is didn't alter. He has always been the second person of the Godhead. He did not acquire something else in that context. But his nature was changed fundamentally forever. And so when Christ is at the throne of God interceding on our behalf, he is still the God-man doing that. He is still fully God and fully human standing in our place and interceding for us. Now, if you pause to consider what this means, it eradicates all claims from anybody else that they have any part 
in the intercession of Christ for us. So it strips away every claim of every saint, of every mother, of every person, of every other thing, and it, it relegates to them who are living and who can pray the opportunity to intercede, but interceding through Christ, who is the intercessor for us. For there is nobody else who is God and man made one. There is nobody else who has that fundamental nature. And so Christ's intercession for us is a continuing expression of what God has done in Jesus. It is an ongoing work of his ministry, and it is a perpetual offering that he makes before God in that intercession on our behalf. So when we pray, and we pray in Jesus' name, we are offering our prayers up to Christ, who then delivers our prayers to God. This is the work of Jesus. It means that anybody outside of Christ has never prayed. They've talked to the sky, they've talked to the ceiling, they've talked to themselves, but they've never prayed. Because the only prayers that get communicated to God are those that come through Christ. The first prayer that any of us ever uttered was the cry for mercy. And that only happens after God changes our hearts and calls us to life. God moves first awakens us, calls us to life. We see our sin as what it is, and we cry for mercy to the God who offers it. This is the first prayer that any hear. But having been found in Christ, all of our prayers are laid out before the Father by the loving hand of Christ, who even now continues to fulfill his role as mediator and intercessor for his people. It is a glorious thing to consider that Jesus, even now, is still demonstrating what he has done. Christ's nature is still human and still divine, and it has been exalted and glorified, but it remains human as ours will be after the resurrection. So Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 49, he says, As we have borne the image of the man of dust, we also shall bear the image of the heavenly man. So here's the thing that occurred to me as I was reading and praying through this passage of Scripture. We, I've always looked at this as a statement about the resurrection, and it is. It's a statement about the fact that when we are raised, we will be given a body like Jesus. We will be given a, a, a spiritual body with a physical presence that is fit for the presence of God. But it never occurred to me that that also means that Jesus has a body like we're going to be given. Right? I mean, it seems obvious. It works both ways. If we have a body like his, then he has a body like ours. But there is a, a physical dimension in the presence of God that we must not forget. And it is the glory of Christ to fully show forth all that God did in his creation. He truly is the capstone of everything that God has done. And he acts in honor and glory when he prays for us. You see, God commanded Jesus to ask him on our behalf. In Psalm chapter 2, Verses 7 and 8, it says, I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten of you, or today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. So when we offer our prayers, they are going through the person of Christ who is fulfilling God's command. So Jesus is not offering prayers that are unwelcome. He is not having to twist God's arm to make him listen. God said, you need to ask me what you need. You need to come before me, and I will give to you what you ask. I will give you the nations as your inheritance, and I will give to you all that is asked of me, because I delight in you. This is what God has said to Jesus. Ask me. Watch me. See me pour these things out. So our prayers, when we offer them up through Christ, they're not only heard by God, they are welcomed by him, and they are welcomed by him because of the glory of Christ that surrounds our prayers. It means that when we talk to God, there is nothing mundane about this whatsoever, because our prayers become that which honors God, because it is obedience to him for us to even ask. It is obedience to God for us to pray. It is obedience for God for us to give to Christ the glory which is his as intercessor. And he sanctifies those prayers at the throne of God by his mere presence. Revelation 8, chapter 8, verses 3 and 4 says, Then another angel 
having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. John Owen in his commentary about Hebrews writes that that angel is representative of Christ. Um, it, it is a remarkable thing to consider. So is Jesus, when he is praying in heaven, is he praying in the same manner as he did when he was on the earth? Not exactly. When he was on the earth, his prayers were different. Um, here, he cried out for help against the temptations of the flesh. Hebrews 5, 7 says, In the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, was heard because of his godly fear. So if Jesus himself fought temptation and fought weakness and fought sorrow and fought despair and fought all the things that we face by praying, what do you think we ought to do? Perhaps pray? Perhaps we should obey and understand that we have no greater weapon for the defense of our own soul than to commune with the Father through the Son. And when we do this, we render unto him the glory that is his due as intercessor. How arrogant is it of us to say to God, yes, I know that you have prepared Christ to intercede on our behalf, but I'm bigger than him and I don't need him. I can be strong. I can get through this. I can muddle my way around. Is that really something we want to say? I don't think so. I think that as followers of Christ, it's important for us to recognize that even in the act of praying, we are giving glory to Christ, for he is interceding on our behalf. He is standing in the presence of God, offering our prayers as his own output. In his glory, he has no temptations at all. So his prayer is more like unto his high priestly prayer. Look at John chapter 17. We're just going to read a piece of this, but perhaps it will show my point. John 17, we'll start at verse 20. It says this, I do not pray for these alone. So this is where Jesus is praying for you, by the way, in, in the course of his high priestly prayer. He starts off, he prays for himself, and he prays for the disciples who are still with him, and then he prays also for us. And this is the section we're in. It says, I do not pray for these alone, that's the disciples, but I also pray for those who will believe me through their word, that they may all be one as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they may also be one in us, and that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave to me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may be perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, where you loved me before the foundation of the world. So Jesus here is praying with absolute confidence about his perfect union with God, and he's asking the Father to share that union with us. He's asking the Father to take our stock and our ability to come before him and unite it to his own. This is intercession. This is Jesus saying, listen to them, value them on my account. Understand that what I'm asking for them I am asking for them because of me, not because of them. And this is important for us to get our heads around. It's not the truth that we are all that special. It's not the truth that we are all that wonderful because, frankly, we're not. It's the truth that Christ is wonderful and that Christ has loved us for some reason that makes no sense to anybody but himself. And he has saved us and called us unto himself and by his right and, and property and person, and power, and might, and glory, and will, and strength, and every other thing that is a part of him, he adds us to his prayers before God, and says, God, listen to them for my sake. Listen to them because I have been faithful. Now, beloved, if you need another reason to love Jesus, I propose that this is a pretty good one. If you need another reason to exalt Christ as worthy of praise, I would propose that your opportunity to be heard by the Father for his account is a pretty good one. And ultimately, as followers of Christ, 
We need to recognize that everything we do and everything we are should be focused on bringing glory and honor to the risen Christ. It should be such a thing that our very intention and our very heart is aimed at him. That all that we are and all that we do should be focused on Jesus and his glory. He knew what God's will was, and he was comfortable in his obedience to it. And this prayer truly is the cloud of incense in heaven. As he was praying this high priestly prayer, he was looking just a few hours in the future when he would be crushed for the sake of our salvation. And, and that was preparing the incense that was going to be offered, right? So I mentioned last week, you know, basil and Larry's comment about how we crush basil and can never use the spice the same way after that. But incense worked the same way. They would take the incense and it was usually large and, and, and in big chunks because it was mixed up and, and made and, and fashioned together. It wasn't just a powder, but they would take the incense and they would crush it before they burned it. And when they crushed it, the perfume would come out and the aroma of the incense would come out. And after they crushed it up, they would then set fire to it. And so this is exactly what is happening. The suffering of Christ um, is about to be manifest. Turn back to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 and think again with me about this reality of Christ and his suffering being a sweet and beautiful aroma before God the Father. Starting at verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone into his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Skip down to verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him or to crush him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and he made intercession for the transgressors. So even in his act of sacrifice, his intercessory ministry was taking place. Beloved, don't miss this. When Jesus was on the cross, he was acting intercessorily for you. He was acting in your stead. He was dying in your place. He was interceding on behalf of the Father and saying, Father, look upon my suffering as theirs. Look upon my misery, my pain, my death as theirs. Count my suffering to their account and credit my righteousness to them. This is what Christ was doing. And his intercession began there in many, many ways and continues even now. He covered the altar and the mercy seat with the cloud of his own intercession on our behalf. So this is where it began. But what is it now? Well, it is a continual merciful act of Christ to offer our prayers and to offer our lives. It is a continual and eternal demonstration of just exactly who Jesus is and exactly what he has done. He is eternally in the presence of God, and he perpetually demonstrates the efficacy of his death in our place. So Christ being there as intercessor is a constant reminder before the throne of grace that we have an advocate, that we have somebody who stands in our place, and that our sin has been dealt with. Not that God needs reminders, but it brings glory to Christ to remind all of heaven just exactly what he has done. It brings glory to Christ and it brings joy and, and glory to the Father that Christ is there. It is accompanied by his own love for us on display. His love magnifies his goodness. Right When Christ loves us, it says much about him and not so much about us. And if you have problems with that, I want you to think about it this way. Most of you in this room know what it is to be loved by somebody, 
or you knew what it was to be loved by somebody. When you think on that love, do you say to yourself, oh, they're so wonderful. I must be awesome for them to love me that much. Right? I have an excellent wife, and she does things for me and for my family that is beyond my ability to understand. And every time she does it, I don't think to myself, I'm pretty good. Look how good she serves me. I think to myself, wow, how wonderful she is. I think to myself, how, how great a gift God has given me in giving me a wife like my wife. It speaks of her goodness, how she serves and ministers to her family, and not our worth. I promise you that. Beloved, for all of us, when we recognize and think on the love of Christ for us, do not make the mistake of thinking that it communicates your goodness. Don't make the mistake of thinking that Christ loves you because you're just that wonderful, because that's not how love works. I mean, ultimately, when you love somebody, you think they're pretty cool. But that's not why Christ loves us. He loves us because he wants to love us. And he is good to us because he is good, not because we deserve it. He's good to us because his glory is being displayed in that. It is a reality for him to say that he loves us and he demonstrates it in his tender care for us. He demonstrates us in watching over the little things, right? In the way that he made sure that the limbs that fell weren't so much that you couldn't deal with them. And in making sure that the limb that fell didn't fall on your car, although it might have been better if it had. But that, that, that whole reality is Christ caring for us in countless ways. It is Christ giving to us his mercy, his care, his love. He desires the best welfare for his own bride. Right? The body of Christ is the bride of Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. And Christ wants what's best for us. He desires that we would honor him with our lives because that is best. It's not that he's sitting up in heaven going, you know, I'm feeling sort of empty and I need the praises of the people in order to fill me up. He's not a Greek god, right? The Greeks believed that their gods would be slain if they stopped praising them. Well, does God cease to exist if we don't praise him? No. He's not made by our praises. He's not fed by our praises. Our praises to him, they help us. They lift our eyes to that which is best and truest. They, they exalt our hearts that we might be more than we are. So Christ doesn't love us because of some selfish need for something. He loves us because he has more to give than we can possibly understand. He has done and completed the work of our deliverance in his death and ultimately, the reality of our salvation rests upon his goodness before us. It rests upon his glory and his power and his sacrifice in our place before the very throne of God. And this fullness of everything that Jesus has done is the continuing intercession that he alone is qualified to offer. He appears himself, not in any way allowing any substitute or aid in this work of intercession. Now I want to hammer this point really clearly for us. There is nobody else in heaven who can intercede for you but Jesus Christ. Nobody. There is no saint up there praying for you. Mary does not have any special ability to offer, offer prayers up and to intercede on your behalf. No matter what the Catholic Church says, Mary is not the co-intercestrix with Christ. It is Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. And this is offered to us not on my word, but on the authority of Scripture itself. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, it says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24, it says, Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands. <laughs> Pardon me. He has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Notice what the writer of Hebrews does not say. He didn't say Mary's going into the heavenly places to intercede on our behalf. He doesn't say the saints are there interceding on our behalf. This is all false. This is all fallacy. This is all make-believe. And so those who pray to anybody but Christ are not praying. 
Those who hope that their prayers are being heard because somebody besides Christ is interceding for them are imagining their hope. And there is no hope in them. Because Christ, when he appears in the presence of God, represents his own death before the throne. And it renders his intercession effective. You understand this? Remember how he's described in Revelation chapter 5? Remember what it says about Jesus when he was in, in the presence of God? Revelation chapter 5, verse 6. It says, I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain. So how does Jesus appear before God? Bearing the marks of his crucifixion as a lamb having been slain. And there is nobody but Jesus who bears that. Nobody. And ultimately, since Jesus is interceding on our behalf, bearing the marks of his crucifixion, bearing the marks of his sacrifice, this is the reminder before all of heaven that the prayers that he is conveying in that sacrifice need to be heard. Because our prayers are not heard for our sake, but for his. It is his glory. It is his strength. It is his power. Now, as a point of technicality, him appearing and representing himself and, and appearing as a lamb having been slain does not actually constitute prayer. Um, prayer is, or intercession is prayer. Um, verse uh, 26 of Romans chapter 8 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So speaking of prayer, or 1 Timothy 2.1, Therefore I exhort all, to give prayers, supplications, intercessions, and giving of thanks for all men. Um, but they are the things that surround his intercession. So when we talk about his intercession, we're not necessarily talking about him just standing before the throne as a lamb having been slain. That's why he's heard. But there's an active component in it. So this is not a passive reality. That's, that's why I make this point. This is not a passive thing that Jesus does. He's not just up there um, acting like a a conduit with nothing to do. He, he is actively presenting our prayers. So you offer prayer, and he translates it through his own glory. The Spirit translates it through his own glory. And it is laid before God because of the active intercession of Jesus Christ. And beloved, there's nobody else who can do this. There is nobody else who has the qualifications or the ability to offer up prayers. He alone offers up prayers according to his desire for the church. Look at Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, starting at verse 19, it says this. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Why do we come before the throne of God? Why do we pray? Because he's faithful. Why do we come? Because we have a high priest who is even now standing before the presence of God, interceding on our behalf. Why do we come before God? Because he has commanded us to. Why do we come before God? Because we really have no other hope. We have nothing else. When, when you think you have other options, you might try those other options. And people do. In every manner of life and in everything that we seek, we will always take what is the easiest option. We will always take what is the simplest solution. But when your options are limited to one, odds are that's what you're going to do. Beloved, God made it this way on purpose. You have no option but Christ if you wish to be saved. If you wish to be heard of God, if you wish to have an audience before the king, you have no path to get there but Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. He alone is our advocate. And it extends to such things as our ongoing sin. 
Now, it's no secret that we all sin. It's no secret that we all fall, that we all fail, that we all get it wrong. For most of us, more than not. But listen to how John describes it in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. He says, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. Okay, I blew it. What else you got for me, John? If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So Christ stands before God as our advocate. Now, an advocate is honestly, in my mind, a little bit stronger than an intercessor. An intercessor brings what you brought, communicates it. An advocate actually takes your side. He stands up and says, pay attention. This is my client. This is the person that I'm representing. And I have something strong to say about them. An advocate is somebody who pleads your case with vehemence. An advocate is somebody who is on your side 100%. And that's a, that's a really powerful addition to the picture of Christ as intercessor. Because we might be tempted to think that Jesus communicates our prayers but isn't really behind them. Yeah, okay, fine. They offer the prayer, the system's set up, so yeah, okay, listen to this prayer, God, you do what you want. But Christ is there actively, passionately pleading our cause. He is our advocate with the Father. He is our legal representation. And as he prays, he also reaffirms his own submission to God. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 27 and 28 says this. He has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it's evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now, when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So this reality that Christ is praying and interceding on our behalf is also subject to the will and the purpose of God. He is submissive to the purpose of God. Now, for some, that might be a terrible thing. But if we recognize that we are saved by the will and purpose of God alone, it gives us confidence. Because here's the truth. Let's lay this out quickly. Who chose you? God. And why did God choose you? Because he wanted to. And there is no answer given besides that. Before the foundations of the world, God in love chose you to be saved. And he chose you to have your sins counted in the death of Christ and the righteousness of Christ applied to you. He has done this for all of his elect children. So the fact that God himself is there receiving these requests and God himself is the one who is finally the, the Lord and master over all of this, should fill us with confidence and with hope. Because Christ is submissive to the will of the Father, but the will of the Father includes the salvation of the elect. This is the will of God. This is the purpose of God. Jesus is not doing an end run around the will of the Father. And many times people set it up sort of like this. They'll say, well, God is really against you, but Jesus is kind of neutral and Mary's the one you want to go to because she's nice like us. That's how it's usually played out. I've had literally hundreds of Catholics explain it to me in words about like that. That's how they think about it, because that's what they've been taught. But that's not what is consistent with Scripture. What is consistent with Scripture is the truth that God is the one who is for us, because God has demonstrated this in saving us. His will and His purpose has been made manifest in the death of Christ, and there is nothing that Jesus is doing that is not 100% consistent with the will of God. He is not doing something that God is opposed to, which means that the will of God is supporting the work of Jesus in his intercession. Isn't that cool? The will of God is why the intercession works. Because this is the will of the Godhead in his entirety. All three persons of the Godhead are involved in this intercessory mission. All three persons of the Godhead are receiving glory, and Christ is receiving the foremost glory because he's the one who died in our place. And he is the lamb that Christ has, or that God has determined to exalt. And Jesus is also the conduit of grace delivered unto us because he is the yes and amen of God for every promise ever given. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says that in him, all of the promises of God are yes and amen to the glory of the Father. This is who Christ is. He is the yes of God. And this means that his mediation 
acts in accordance to the will of God, and there is purpose in it. His eternal life and his eternal intercession are bound together in his purpose. His eternal intercession is the very purpose of his mediation. Okay? So Jesus is our mediator. He is our go-between between us and God. And the purpose for that mediation is so that he might intercede on our behalf. This will and purpose is bound together in everything that Christ has done and is doing. He is mediating on our behalf because of his great love for us, and he lives to rule the church and all things. What Do you remember the name that he has written on his thigh in Revelation 19? What is it? King of kings and Lord of lords, right? It is his authority that governs all things. And beloved, that extends to the church. It is the authority of Christ that governs the church. It is the authority of Christ who is Lord over his church. We have no king but Jesus. It is important for us to remember this because there are kings on the earth who try to tell us that we may not speak the truth of God. And there are kings upon the earth who will do their best to crush the church for speaking that truth. And there are kings upon the earth who will do all that they can to stop the work of the church and stop the proclamation of the gospel because there are kings upon the earth who hate the glory of God and they show it in all of their actions. The question is, to whom do we bend the knee? We have no king but Jesus. And we honor him above all. And the disciples laid this out for us. They were commanded not to speak the name of Jesus again. And their answer was so succinct. They said, whether it's right for us to obey God or whether to obey you or God, you guys decide. But as for us, our decision, we will honor our God. We will obey the word of God and we will do what we've been told to do. You can't tell me not to speak the name of Jesus because I'm going to. And if that means that someday they take my head for it, the last words out of my mouth will be Jesus is king. He is Lord over all. I have nothing else. I have no other hope. If Christ is not king, it's all a lie. If he's not Lord, there's no hope anywhere. But because he is Lord, nothing they can do to me will harm me in any way that matters. The very worst thing they can do is the very best thing I can receive. A quick ticket home. <laughs> and there's glory in that. And there's purpose in that. And there's joy in that. And the reality is this. Christ lives to rule. But he also lives to subdue his enemies. So even if they kill us, does that mean that the cause of Christ dies with us? Well, they've been trying to stamp the church out for 2,000 years. And every time they do... All they do is spread a lot of blood, and history tells us that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. So it's sort of like trying to get rid of dandelions or thistles by blowing the seeds off. Okay, good luck with that. Not going to happen. This is what they do. And they do it this way because God is determined to spread his church. And he will not be stopped. Psalm 2, we read verses 7 and 8. But listen to 2, verses 8 and 9. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations as your inheritance, and the ends of the earth for your possession. And you shall break them with a rod of iron, and you shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Does Christ have any thought that he's not going to win in the end? He's already triumphed. And the display of his victory is a foregone conclusion. He also lives to give the Holy Spirit to his children. John 14, 16 says, I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. So why do we have the Holy Spirit? Because Christ gave him, yes. Is that the only time he prayed the Father that we would have the Holy Spirit? No. Every time we cry out for help, every time we cry out for mercy, every time we cry out for his spirit to be upon us, for, for, for strength, for comfort, for wisdom, for understanding, for all the things that the spirit gives us, Christ is interceding before the Father according to his own death and suffering for us and asking God to send his spirit upon his children. It is an ongoing work of his intercession for you. His love being displayed in the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
he continues to show forth over and over and over again that he is willing to do whatever is needful so that his children might have what they need. Do we need the Spirit of God? Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. We need what he offers. We need his mercy. We need his spirit. We need his glory. We have to have him or we have nothing. Look, if we try to do this on our own, we fail. If we try to do this in our own strength, we fail. If we try to do this in some manner that is not centralized around Jesus Christ and his work in our place, we fail. And over and over and over again, man always seeks to put something else besides Jesus in the middle of our transaction with God. But God has been very clear. It is Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Nothing else will ever happen that will translate into success but Jesus Christ. You can fight and you can struggle and you can limp along and you can do your best to come up with some other option. But in the end, Christ will display his supremacy in all things. And the end of Psalm 2, 9 says that he will dash them to pieces with a rod of iron. Right? Now, in Philippians, it says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And Gene and I have an ongoing discussion about this. And he, he's convinced that we will see Jesus and willingly say Jesus is Lord even if we're not converted. And I think he could be right. But there's a part of me that reads Psalm 9 and thinks that they're going to bend the knee because Christ has crushed their knees with a rod of iron and they have no choice but to submit. That he is, there is a display of his kingship and his authority and his power and his majesty that destroys all opposition. And I'll be honest with you, there's a part of me that longs for that day. There's, there's a huge part of me that begs him to tarry because there are people that I love who don't know him. There's a large part of me that longs for that day and let it be today. Maranatha, Lord, come quickly. Because the evil around us grows stronger every day and it is so disheartening. And there is promise here and there is hope here and there is truth here that no matter what today looks like, in the end, Christ is always going to be victorious. And I don't know how to balance that out, and I promise you I get it wrong more often than not. But the truth here is, is for us to recognize that Christ wins. And he wins because he has always been obedient to the Father. So this work of mediation is about the display of his glory. It's about the fullness of everything that Jesus has done. And like everything that he does, his glory is to be made manifest in it. When Jesus mediates for us, we need to be thankful that he's doing so. We don't just need to pray and, and know that he hears us and know that we can pray because of his, his intercession for us and just let that be the end of it. Somewhere in our hearts that has to translate into gratitude. Somewhere in that heart that has to translate into us saying, God, you are worthy of praise. Christ, you are worthy of glory and honor because you still continue to do this. You still continue to stand in my place. You still continue to offer my prayers up as your own. May you be praised forever. May you be honored forever. May your glory extend to the end of all things. Now, it's also true, though, that the work and the glory of Christ on the cross is so magnificent and so glorious that it exceeds the one-off reality of his death and crucifixion. Now, I'm going to try and unpack this because I, I don't want anybody to think that I'm suddenly thinking that we, we have to crucify Christ again. That's not my point. But if you have a single action and you say, this occurred here and this moment in time, there is a temptation for us to let that thing be and then get on with our lives. All of us have things in our life that have been epochs. They have been great moments. Or they've been terrible moments. We have, we have times of great trial or times of great joy. We have these moments of epoch, and when they occur, we feel like they define all of life. All of life gets sucked into them. They're like a black hole that draws everything in. Our emotions, our thoughts, our feelings, everything. It gets drawn in. 
But it is the nature of such epochs that after a while they begin to fade. You know, the wisdom of old says time heals all wounds. I don't know if it heals all wounds, but it does numb us to the pain after a while. Right? Well, do we want Christ's death and sacrifice and glory in that sacrifice to ever be something that is numbed by time? No, and neither does God. So as Christ appears before the throne of God as a lamb having been slain, it is a constant reminder of what he has done. And there is a glorious display of Jesus' work in that intercession. His intercession not only benefits us, it glorifies him. You see, sinners could not be saved without the death of Jesus. Amen? I think I make that point. I hope I make it plain. I try to make it plain. I try to make sure that I say that. And, and beloved, hear me. I've been, I've been reminded that I need to be a little clearer about what you do with that. So maybe somebody's here this day, or maybe somebody's going to listen to this online, and they say, great, I know that Jesus is the only way, but you never tell me what to do with that. So let me be really plain. You need to face God and ask him for mercy. You don't need some magic sinner's prayer. I'm not going to give you one. You don't need somebody to tell you, repeat these words after me and you'll be saved. You don't need me to assure you that you're saved before God. Here's what you do. You say, God, please have mercy. You repent of your sin and you turn unto God. You ask him for what he promised to give based on the fact that you believe he'll do what he says he will do. It's that simple. It's not magic. Well, it is kind of magic. But, but it's not something that you have to do in a specific way. You're going to speak words that are true to your life and heart. You're going to speak your own heart out to God, and God will hear you because of this intercession. And you have no hope in being saved unless you are carried to heaven on the arms of Christ. Amen. And if you are not found in him, you have nothing. And all of your righteousness is filthy rags and vile and disgusting in the sight of God. And he will banish you from his presence forever if you dare to stand before him and say, look at what I did. And there's no coming back from that. But here's the part we often miss. The eternal life and intercession of Jesus Christ is the only hope of Christians being saved as well. Because it is not a punctiliar action. It is not something that God is willing to to let just stand. Listen to Romans 5.10. If we were enemies, if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? If we were reconciled to God by his death when, when we hated God, when we were enemies to his glory, when we despised his very nature and person, then how much more blessing and, and powerful and glorious is our hope and promise that is delivered to us by the life of Christ since we are now sons of God? See, his life is our hope. His resurrection is our reason for being. Romans 8.34 says, Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore also is risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? We love these verses, but have you ever noticed right in the middle of them, it is his intercession on our behalf that is the reason that this is true. But we often think about it like this. We often say to ourselves, I said the prayer, I believed God, I was saved, and therefore nothing can separate me from God. But that's not what it says. What it says is, Christ holds on to you. He is interceding on your behalf, and nothing can rip you from his grasp. Nothing. Your hope is in the strength of his hand and not yours. I use this example every once in a while, but it, it has been brought out to me over and over again as we have raised children, many of them ours, many of them not. And, and as I walk with little kids in dangerous places, I'll usually give them my finger to hold. Yeah. I do. But then I reach down with the rest of my hand and I close my hand around their arm. And if they fall, it's not their tiny little fingers holding onto my finger. 
that's going to save them. It's the strength of my good right arm. And that's exactly how God holds us. You cling with everything you have in you. You should. You must. But it's His strength that sustains you. It's His strength that holds you close. And you rely upon His goodness and His glory and His majesty and His power to be your hope. It's His work. And He becomes for us the everything that we need. Romans 4 Verses 24 and 25 says, It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. God looks upon the life of Christ as our reason. See, Jesus didn't do this at the start and then leave the rest to us. Right? There are those who think it works that way. That Jesus did something and then he goes, Okay, I've done my part. Y'all do yours. We'll weigh it out in the end. But what did he promise his disciples before he left? This is a really powerful phrase. If you know anything about Scripture, John 14, 18, he says, I will not leave you, you know the next word? Orphans. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. And if you read Scripture at all, if you have any comprehension of how God's heart for the fatherless bleeds, he calls us to stand in defense of the fatherless. He calls us to come alongside those who do not have anybody else to lean upon because he has been that for us. And over and over and over throughout Scripture, God tells us to care for the fatherless and for the widows. And if we're not doing that, we're not Christian. Period. If we're not taking care of those who have nobody, then we need not call ourselves followers of Christ and we should be doing something else right now. We have an obligation to care for those who have no one else to lean on. And in doing that, we are giving testimony to exactly what Christ has done for us. Jesus said, I will not leave you orphans. I'll come to you. He was promising his intercession. He was promising his continued care for us. He was promising the reality that no matter what happens, he is here with us. He will not leave us. He will not abandon us. He will always sustain us. And in the end, this was the eternal purpose of God, and he gave it to us out of his own obedience. And in doing this, he fulfilled God's will all the way back before God ever said, let there be. Look at Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, I want to unpack this just a little bit with you. If we ever get through Hebrews, I'm thinking about Colossians. It's a, it's a glorious, glorious book. But anyway. Colossians chapter 2, starting at verse 11, it says, In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, by the putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him, through which, I'm sorry, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us and which was contrary to us. He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them in it. What's he saying? He's saying that all the way from the very beginning, God's purpose in the victory of Christ has been the plan from the start. The law was against us. And people look at that and say, why would God give us a law we couldn't keep? Because we were never supposed to keep it. What was the law according to Galatians? It was a tutor to bring us to Christ. It was something to teach us of our great need for somebody to stand in our stead. It was that which God gave to show us how desperately we needed his intercession. It was that which God gave us to show us our great and terrible sin. The law's only purpose is to break us. That's it. Now, the Ten Commandments, the moral law of God, 
that also has the added benefit of teaching us the nature of God. Every single commandment reflects an attribute of God's glory. He tells us don't commit adultery because he is faithful, right? He tells us to respect life and to not be murderers because he is the giver of life. He tells us in the first four of the law that he's the only God who is and that all of our life revolves around him. He tells us in everything that we do according to the law who he is. But the greater context of the law, the, the Levitical law, the things that people were supposed to do, it never saved anybody. And it never will. It can't. It's not possible that the law will save anybody because it's not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to actually take away sin. The writer of Hebrews tells us that plainly. It is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. So those who believe that somehow by some establishment of a new temple, there's going to be some opportunity for people to be saved by a renewed sacrificial system, they're lying to themselves and they're disregarding the scripture. It never did work that way, and it never shall. That would be to say that the death of Christ is unnecessary. Do you understand that? Do you understand why that is? Because if bulls and goats could get it done, then God was pretty darn stupid for slaughtering his son. You understand? We need to be clear about this. We need to be clear in our own thinking so that we don't get sucked into foolishness. We need to be clear in how we speak to people. But we also need to be clear in our intention to give Christ the full praise which is his due as our intercessor. Because as soon as we allow that nonsense in, it diminishes Jesus. It makes less of him. And that's something that we should be constantly on the guard for. It should be something that we are always careful to not allow to have any room. Because nobody but Jesus could accomplish what is needed on our behalf. Nobody but he could fulfill his promises to us. And beloved, hear me. No matter how much I try to lay this out, nobody but Jesus actually knows how great the work of his salvation for us is. Amen? Nobody but God, nobody but the Father, nobody but the Son, nobody but those who actively did it. He alone has the power and the wisdom to fulfill that great work that he alone understands. So he completely conceives it, he completely understands it, and he alone can fulfill what he conceives and understands. That's pretty amazing. There's lots of times that we look at things and we say, well, I can figure out how to do that, I just can't do it. Or the other way around, we can say, if you can sort out an answer, I'll get it done. But Jesus is the whole thing. He is the only one who can conceive of it, who can plan it, and who can accomplish it. He alone has the grace to overcome our rebellious hearts. If you think you're not still a rebel, you don't know yourself very well. If you think that you're not still actively rebelling against the will of God, you, you haven't been honest with yourself. Because this is something we have to fight against all the time. At every occurrence, when we do something that is contrary to the will of God, make no mistake, it is rebellion. And we're gracious to ourselves, we're kind to ourselves. We say things like, well, everybody makes mistakes. A mistake is what you do in a math computation. Right? You're, you're writing, you're tallying a list of numbers, you forget to carry a 1 or a 12 or whatever you're going to carry up there, and you get the wrong number. It happens to me occasionally at the bank. I always ask them, check my math. Because I always try to do it in my head just so I can, you know, retain what little intelligence I might have once had. So I, but I do ask them, please check my math. And occasionally, Jenna will go, you, uh, you forgot something here. <laughs> That's a mistake. When I do something I know I'm not supposed to do, that's rebellion. And I, I dare not. I dare not ever couch it in anything less. I'm actively rebelling against the goodwill and sovereign pleasure of my God. And I have to repent of that. I have to ask him for forgiveness anew. Now, I'm not saying I've lost my salvation and then if I don't ask for that forgiveness, I'm going to hell. Because I'm saved by his work and not mine. But I long to live in a relationship with Christ that is constant and flowing and vibrant. And I cannot tolerate sin in the mix. Or I don't get that. Does that make sense? Because it's his glory of interceding on our behalf. 
It's his glory that saved me in the first place, and it's his glory that communicates that salvation unto me. And it's his glory that offers to me the mercy to know that I can still come. I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm guilty of having a, a finite amount of mercy for people. Somebody will, will do something over and over and over and over and over again, and I reach a point where I go, you know what? Find somebody else. I'm done. That's not Christ-like. That's sin. That's rebellion. I need to ask for forgiveness for that. I need to ask for God to change my heart so that I will love like he loves. Here's the truth. Why does that matter? Because that's how he loves us. And, and I am going to rely upon his mercy and submit to his lordship. Now, here's a secret you may not ever have thought about. It is no test of lordship when you're only asked to do things that you want to do. Amen? I heard in a movie, the line was put like this. It is no friendship which only, no, he said, friendship means nothing when it is convenient. That was the line. Friendship means nothing when it's convenient. It means that sometimes our friendships require things of us, our relationships require things of us that are not convenient, that are not easy, that are not what we would want. But it also means that I have to be willing to obey God even when it's not something I want to do. Because it is no test of lordship when all of his commands are what I want. It's no test of my submission to him when all of his commands are what I want. And I'll be very honest with you. For most human beings that I have ever encountered in my life, the place where that comes to bear most often is in the realm of forgiveness. And if you'll think over the parables of Jesus, Jesus told us that. Plainly, he said in the parable of the unjust steward, so will your father do to you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Right? Why does it matter? Because it is the glory of Christ in our intercession. It is the glory of Christ interceding on our behalf. It is the glory of Christ who is showing us the mercy that is continually being provided by his suffering on our account. And if we want that from him, we need to recognize that it cost him something and not make that cheap by our refusal to offer what we ourselves have been given. Amen. Beloved, this is such a precious, precious thing this opportunity to give glory to Christ as we think about his intercession on our behalf. And it applies to all of our lives. It extends beyond anything that you may have imagined, anything that you may have said. And I'll tell you the truth, no matter how hard I try to unpack it, I'll never be able to get it all. Don't worry, I'm not going to spend another week on 725. But I want you to recognize that this is something that is so beautiful that God will always bring it to the fore. And he will always show us the glory of Christ. His joy. Because he delights in the sun. And since the sun is magnified in us, we get to bathe in that delight as well. That's pretty cool. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you give to us grace in this day. And I pray, Lord, that as we think on these things, you would expand our imagination and our understanding of your truth so that we would be conformed to the image of Christ in everything. And God, I pray that uh, over and above all that we are, that our whole reason for being would be the glory of Jesus. We ask it in his name for his glory.